The Cardinals get the month of September started tonight at home against the Cubs. We'll preview that series and what to expect in the month of September. The Cardinals also made some roster moves that we will update you on, and we'll do our weekly mailbag where we answer your questions all on today's episode of Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinal fans. I'm J.D. Haffer, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou, lifetime Cardinals fan, and your host for Locked On Cardinals, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, covering your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter at J.D. Sports Radio and follow the podcast at LO underscore Cardinals. I want to thank those of you who make Locked On Cardinals your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts. You can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe and comment so you can interact with us. This is a show serving card donation and giving the best fans in baseball all of the info about the birds on the bat. So the Cardinals come out of an outstanding month of August where they went 22-7, and seven, which was tied for the most wins in the league with the Dodgers. They've opened up a six-and-a-half game lead over the Brewers, who had a rough August, going 12-15, and 15, and are 37 and 42 since the beginning of June. They lost last night, by the way, getting shut out by Merrill Kelly and the Arizona Diamondbacks. So the Cardinals, meanwhile, on the other side, they've gone 48 and 34 and have pretty much taken control of the NL Central as we begin the schedule here in September. Now, they begin the month with three against the Cubs this weekend, who did have a decent August. They went 15 and 15. Then they get four at home against the Washington Nationals, who have the worst record in baseball. Then they go to Pittsburgh for three. The Pirates, they have the third worst record in baseball. Then they come back for two against the Brewers. Then five games and four days at home against the Reds, who have the fifth worst record in baseball. So that's 17 games against some not-so-good teams with only the Brewers with a winning percentage over 500. And as I mentioned earlier, they haven't been a 500 team since June. They've got a losing record. So... This is pretty nice, pretty good setup for the Cardinals as we start September. Now, things will get a bit tougher in the back half of the month when the team travels out west for three games against the Padres and then three against the Dodgers. Now, the Padres, as we all know, made all those moves at the deadline. Didn't take off quite the way some people thought they would, but they've now won seven of their last 10 and three straight going into today. The Dodgers, meanwhile, have been a, a juggernaut all season. You know, they're they're 90 and 40 on the year. They're incredible. They then play two in Milwaukee, and that's right before they finish up the month and the season with six in a row against the Pirates. The first three will be in St. Louis, the final three in Pittsburgh, and then that's all, folks. The season is a wrap. So you look at this, and to my knowledge, there really is no reason, barring some sort of epic collapse and wild injuries, that this team shouldn't win the NL Central. It's theirs. The Brewers are out west again uh, against Arizona and Colorado, but... This month, they still have to face the Mets and the Yankees, plus the Cardinals, with the games against the uh, Giants, the Marlins, and the Reds sprinkled in. So on paper, that's a tougher schedule for the Brewers than, than, the, the, than what the Cardinals are facing here in September. So it, it's set up very nicely for them here. So let's talk about the Cubs this weekend. Let's go into it. Uh, mentioned they had a 500 record in August, which for them is a big deal considering they're in a rebuild. We know this. Uh, the Cardinals just won three of five against them at Wrigley, but the Cubbies played the Cardinals tough, which they normally do, especially in Chicago. Overall, the Cardinals are 10 and six against the Cubs this year and four or two against them at Bush Stadium, which isn't much of a surprise considering how good the Cardinals have been at home this season. So who gets the ball tonight? It'll be Jordan Montgomery for St. Louis. And to say he has dominated the Cubs this season might be an, an understatement, to be honest with you, in two starts against them. One for the Yankees and one for the Cardinals. He's 2-0. He's thrown 16 innings. He's walked none. He has struck out 12. And he's allowed zero runs. That's right, zero. Montgomery threw seven shutout innings against them with the Yankees at Yankee Stadium on June 11th. And then it hasn't been that long. I'm sure you remember the August 22nd game when Montgomery threw the Maddox, tossing a complete game shutout in just 99 pitches at Wrigley. 
other than a tough game against the Braves, who, duh, really tough team in the first place. They're very, very good. Montgomery has been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. We'll continue his dominance uh, over the Cubs, hopefully tonight at Bush Stadium. On the other side, the Cubs will have right-hander Adrian Sampson on the mound. One and four this year, ERA 3.97. The Cardinals have faced him twice already this season, back in June at Bush. He went five innings, allowed two runs on four hits, walked two, struck out five, got a no decision, but the Cardinals ended up winning that game five to three. Then they face him again on August 23rd in Chicago. He lasted just three and a third, gave up five runs on eight hits, including two home runs by Nolan Arenado and Tyler O'Neill. So certainly a matchup that favors the Cardinals tonight. So we hope for good things this evening with the Cardinals against the Cubs. Now, what we're going to do, we'll get into the matchups for Saturday and Sunday next. Plus, uh, the team made a couple of roster moves, including calling up one player for the first time in his professional career. Kind of surprised by this move. I think it caught a lot of people off guard. We'll explain it all to you next. But first, are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stoned? What's the worst that can happen? You end up driving below the speed limit. That's no big deal, right? You would be wrong there. The truth is your reaction time slow way down, way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but everyone around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It's not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. Whether it's medicinal purposes, whether it's recreational, just don't do it. Play it smart. Don't get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high. Get a DUI. So back to the baseball field. Saturday's pitching matchup is what we're on to now. We've got Adam Wainwright on the bump against Drew Smiley. Now, Waino has been solid all year. 9-9, 3.09 ERA, has faced the Cubs three times already this season. He's 1-1. One and one. In June at Wrigley, he threw seven innings, allowed two runs, and got the no decision in the Cardinals' victory. August 2nd at Bush, he tossed his seven shutout innings in the Cardinals' 6 to nothing win. Then on August 23rd at Chicago, he started game one of that doubleheader. He goes six innings, allows two runs on five hits. Nothing bad there, but the problem was the Cardinals couldn't hit that game. And they get shut out, and they lose that one two to nothing. Drew Smiley, he has pitched really, really good against the Cardinals in the only game he's faced, uh, St. Louis, allowing the solo home run by one Albert Pujols in the one to nothing loss against Jordan Montgomery. We talked about that game already. Then on Sunday, you've got Miles Michaelis against Marcus Stroman. Now, Miles, he's going to try to get back on track in this one after taking a loss and a no decision in his last two outings. That loss was against the Cubs. That was August 24th when he went six and two-thirds. He gave up five runs. Only three of those were earned, by the way, on six hits as the Cardinals fell seven to one. The long ball kind of been the enemy for Michaelis recently. Got him in Cincinnati. Remember, he gave up those three long flies at Great American Ballpark. But uh, hopefully a return to Bush Stadium and some home cooking will do him some good. At Bush this year, Michaelis, he's been outstanding. Five and two, 2.45 ERA. On the road, eh, not as great. He's 5-8, and eight, 4.41 ERA. Now, Marcus Stroman, he's been ripped by the birds this season. If you remember back in June, nine runs on 10 hits in four innings. August 4th, he was better. Three runs, five hits, six and two-thirds. But then on the 25th, five runs, 11 hits and in five innings. So the Cardinals normally hit him well. Let's hope that trend continues on Sunday when they uh, have the afternoon game at Bush Stadium. Now, the Cardinals did make a couple of roster moves yesterday. Uh, they announced that they have selected outfielder Ben Deluzio onto the big league roster and recalled reliever James Nail from AAA Memphis. They'll take the two extra active roster spots available to teams in September. So uh, the uh, expansion of the rosters, if you remember, it used to be huge. Like like 20 dudes would come back up onto the team in September where uh, they, they, they've, they've shrunk that quite a bit. So who has been Deluzio? Have you ever heard of him? Because I hadn't. I had no idea who this dude was. And so I had to look up some information about him. Luckily for me and you, Anthony Franco from MLBTradeRumors.com was able to write up this about Mr. Ben Deluzio. This would be the first big league call up for Deluzio, who has spent six years in the professional ranks. An undrafted free agent out of Florida State in 2016, the right-handed hitting outfielder first signed with the Diamondbacks. He would spend the next five years in the organization using his speed to post strong results on balls and play, but never hitting for much power. 
The Florida native never hit more than four home runs in a minor league season, and his strikeout rate began to mount as he hit the double-A level. Arizona didn't add Deluzio to the 40-man roster, and he was made eligible in the minor league portion of the Rule 5 draft last offseason. The Cardinals selected him with the 17th pick and assigned him to Memphis. Deluzio has responded with arguably the best season of his career, posting strong numbers in 94 games to earn his first Major League call-up. Through 408 plate appearances this year, the 28-year-old has a slash line of 277, 353, and 429. His nine home runs aren't the mark of a power hitter, but it shatters his previous personal high. The athleticism upon which he's long relied on has remained intact, and he swiped 30 bases in 36 attempts while playing over 700 innings in center field. Deluzio isn't likely to get many starts with the Cardinals looking to wrap up the NL Central over the season's final month, but he adds a speed and defense-oriented player whom manager Ali Marmel can creatively deploy late in games. So you wonder, okay, they brought this guy up. What happened to Juan Yepes? He's healthy, right? He's available, right? Katie Wu from The Athletic pointed out that Juan Yepes isn't eligible to be recalled yet after he was just used when Arenado went on the paternity list, and that Flaherty will need the Deluzio spot on the 40-man roster on Monday when he gets the start against the Nationals on Monday. Pointed that out already. So I guess Deluzio, it looks like he'll only be up for the weekend. So not a real long time. <laughs> so uh, we won't have to worry about him much. Uh, but uh, I guess, you know, if you need him as a pinch runner, Need him to play defense this weekend against the Cubs. I, I suppose he might get used, but uh, it appears that he'll only be up for the weekend and then uh, a DFA probably in, in the future, but we'll see. And then, uh, of course, James Nail. He's been up on the club already this season and has been good. Five appearances, six innings, no runs, two hits, no walks, four strikeouts. A lot of fans have wondered why he was down in the minors in the first place, that they wanted him back up on the team. So now you got him. James Nail, welcome back to the big club. All right, now let's move on to our weekly mailbag segment where we answer your questions that you've posted on either our Locked on Cardinals YouTube page or on Twitter at JD Sports Radio, or you can go to at LO underscore Cardinals on Twitter. Appreciate all the feedback, uh, all the criticisms, all the comments, all the suggestions, and of course, all the questions. So uh, never be shy about reaching out. Sometimes I get direct messages for some reason from people on Twitter, which is fine, I guess. But at the same time, if you just you know, put at JD sports radio or at LO underscore Cardinals. Um, you can give them to me that way as well. Plus it gives uh, the community a chance to kind of respond and we can have a conversation online together instead of it being almost like a, a secret message to me where you guys are sliding into my DMS, not asking for dates or feet pics or anything weird like that, but still, you know, feel free to, to post them up there so that they are public for everyone else to see. So, um, what I would like to do, I want to start with something that was brought up by uh, Sully over at Locked On MLB. So uh, if you didn't see this, uh, I went on to the Locked On MLB podcast uh, on a crossover episode this week, and uh, I'll put the link down in the description on our YouTube page if you guys didn't get a chance to catch it. But we were having a good discussion. I feel like Sully and I get along pretty well, and I feel like we're one of those people that could sit around and just talk baseball for hours. Like he, he's got a lot of knowledge and the history of the game. And he had a lot of knowledge about uh, the history of the Cardinals. And we were going back and forth. And all of a sudden, it was almost a 40-minute episode on the MLB podcast. So we were like, whoa. So I, I'm sure we'll get a chance to uh, reconnect and do another episode at some point. But in case you missed this particular one, link down below. But we were discussing reasons why this Cardinals team has taken off in August. I got to touch on it a, a little bit. But I wanted to expand some since uh, I do get a fair amount of questions on why I think this Cardinals team is winning. First off, I want to give credit to rookie manager Ali Marmel, who has made the transition from a bench coach to manager almost seamlessly. Now, I, uh, we brought up in, in the MLB podcast uh, about Mike Schilt getting fired, Marmel having to come in and take over for a guy who was very, very successful as the manager of the Cardinals, won a manager of the year award while he was manager with the Cardinals. He did a great job. But it looked like he and upper management didn't see eye to eye on some things. And so they let him go. And uh, they trusted Ali. 
and I know all managers are going to make mistakes. It happens. It happens to the best of them. But for the most part this season, he's been able to mix and match as well as anybody in baseball. And he seemed to, to seem to find his groove in August, which, you know, by that point in the season, you kind of know who your pieces are. There's not a lot of turnover anymore on the roster, barring any injuries. So he's got his dudes and he's been doing his best to put the team in the best position to win, even at the cost of everyday at bats for some of the younger players, which we know some people get worked up about. They want to see the young guys. They want to see them get as many at-bats as they possibly can because they want to see this young talent and what they could do at the major league level. But he's been able to somehow talk them all into jumping on board of the fact that to win ball games, they're not going to get to play every day. Younger guys like Dylan Carlson and Nolan Gorman, as much as we want to see those guys in the lineup each day, the stats don't lie. Small sample size, but Gorman has not hit well against left-handers. 222, no home runs, two RBIs, seven strikeouts, Granted, 22 plate appearances against righties, hitting 237, 13 home runs, 31 RBIs, and 259 plate appearances. Eventually, at some point in his career, Gorman will be an everyday player. We know that. But right now, it's against righties only if possible. Carlson, who's a different kind of guy because he's a switch hitter, can go from both sides of the plate, elite defensively. Just hasn't fared well against right-handers this year. He's hitting 210, five home runs, 26 RBIs, and 307 plate appearances. So he's had plenty of chances to prove himself, unlike Gorman against the lefties. He's gone up uh, against the right-handers a ton this year, and he just hasn't produced. Then from the right side of the plate, Carlson, smaller sample size again, 119 plate appearance and appearances, but he's hitting 324. 324! Three home runs, 13 RBIs. Lars Newbar. Everybody loves New. Been tremendous in right field since the Bader injury and then the trade. So he's gotten to play pretty much every day. A much better hitter against righties. 255, 10 home runs, 26 RBIs. Against the lefties, kind of ugly. 205, zero home runs, six RBIs. I mean, that's not kind of ugly. That's ugly. But the difference is he gets on base a lot. On base percentage of 420 in July. Then 422 in August. And I told you yesterday, uh, 23 walks in the month of August, second only to Aaron Judge and Juan, so and Juan Soto in all of Major League Baseball. So that's elite level as far as taking walks. Brendan Donovan, speaking of taking walks and getting on base, this guy, the epitome of a Swiss Army knife for, for Ali on the ball club, plays multiple positions, has an act for getting on base. He's hitting 298, two home runs, 30 RBIs with an OBP of 391 against the righties. Remember, he's a left-handed hitter. But then against lefties, 265, no home run, seven RBIs. Power is not his thing. We know this. But his OBP is 419 against the left-handers. And if he had enough at-bats to qualify, he'd be third in the National League in on-base percentage behind Juan Soto and Paul Goldschmidt. I mean, oh, that, I mean, you're that's the top, man. That's how good Brendan Donovan has been. And utilizing these young players the way that Ali's done so far and, you know, teaming them up with your with your stars, Goldschmidt and Arenado, plus O'Neal getting healthy and locked in. Pujols, I mean, going crazy since the All-Star break. It's been outstanding. So, uh, Ali, fantastic job. I also want to give a shout-out to John Mozalek, Mo in the front office. How about the additions of Jordan Montgomery, Jose Quintana, and let's not forget, because this gets glossed over as well, the additions of JoJo Romero and Chris Stratton in the bullpen. They've been huge. Now, nobody even blinked when the Edmundo Sosa deal went down. They trade him to Philadelphia. He can't hit a lick for St. Louis. Like, we're getting nothing out of him offensively. Defensively, great. Wonderful speed when he gets on base. But he wasn't doing it. They needed the roster spot. They flip him. They get JoJo Romero in the deal. And when it happened, I don't think anybody even cared. Everybody's like, eh, whatever. Now he's like, <laughs> he's your trusted lefty arm in the bullpen. After Cabrera imploded and has been sent down, Romero's thrown five innings since joining the big club. No runs, no walks, one hit, six strikeouts. He's been incredible. Chris Stratton, damn glad to meet you, who seemed like a throw-in in the Quintana deal. His last four appearances, he's thrown six and two-thirds innings, one run on one hit, 
He's walked six, which I hate, but has done a nice job eating innings when they needed him to. He's doing what he was brought on board to do. He's not a guy that's supposed to come in in the seventh and eighth innings in high-pressure situations and get you out of it. He's there to eat innings in case one of your starters doesn't go very far or an injury happens. You know, that that's what he's there for. Palante, same sort of role, except Palante, you trust a little more to get out of tougher situations like he did in Cincinnati recently, whereas Stratton, not so much. Uh, you're bringing him in early in games, fifth, sixth inning, stuff like that. Lower pressure situations, but that's his role, and he's doing fine in it. Um, so those are some of the reasons why I think this Cardinals team is winning. You know, uh, obviously you've got Arenado and Gold. You know, you got these guys doing what they're supposed to be doing on the field. But some of those other reasons are why this team is winning ball games, And uh, I just wanted to point those out because, you know, we could sit there and talk about Jordan Montgomery and talk about how good Wainwright's been in Helsley. It's, you already know that stuff. These other things, they're, they're, they're important as well because it takes a, a complete team to win all these ball games. All right. We got time for uh, one more question here. OK, this was a fun one and I wanted to do this one for sure. So I'm glad we have time to squeeze it in because it's something that it has nothing to do with on the field. This one from Blake out of uh, Baldwin, Missouri. I remember playing at Baldwin Ballpark a lot growing up. Favorite baseball movie? And this is always a, a, a cool question because I love movies. I'm a huge movie guy. If you haven't noticed, I like to drop quotes from movies all the time. It's something that makes my wife sick because <laughs> I do it all the time. But then my guy friends, we can all, we just start going back. and You know how it is with guys. You start going back and forth with between the different quotes. And it's just fun. So um, baseball movies. So there, there's a lot of them to choose from. Okay. Uh, first, for the wife, huge baseball fan as well, by the way, even though she roots for the Cincinnati Reds. It's awesome to be married to somebody who loves baseball as much as I do. Uh, baseball movies, she loves them too. Sandlot. Sandlot's her favorite one. That's always a cool one to watch. Uh, Bad News Bears, early ones, not the remake. Remakes, don't want anything to do with those. Uh, but the early ones... Solid stuff. Um, underrated one, Mr. Baseball starring Tom Selleck. Yeah, yeah, where he gets sent over to Japan and has to play over there. Um, I still use the one line that, that he says in it, which I, I think is perfect. When he gets in trouble for lighting the other guy's shoelace on fire and goofing off in the dugout because they don't do that over there. Um, and he's like, baseball's a game. Games are supposed to be fun, which is true. That's the, that's the whole point. It's supposed to be fun. So uh, that's a solid one. Uh, Kevin Costner's obviously got a bunch of them. Field of Dreams, amazing. Bull Durham, solid. Uh, depicts the minor leagues better than any baseball movie I've ever seen. Uh, For the Love of the Game was one of my dad's favorites. So that's a, that's an emotional one. You got to you gotta, you gotta make sure you got some tissues around on that one. That's a good one. Uh, how about The Natural? Robert Redford, The Wonder Boy Bat, The Whammer. That's a classic one. Um, I love Moneyball. Moneyball Moneyball's fantastic, even though here's my problem with Moneyball, though. Do we got time for this? Yeah, we still got time for this. Okay, Moneyball, the reason why it drives me a little bit nuts is because it doesn't tell you the true whole story about that 2002 Oakland A's team. Yeah, they brought in a bunch of cast offs and guys that weren't really getting signed or playing anywhere else, but at the same time, they also had on their pitching staff, Tim Hudson, <laughs> Mark Mulder. The Cy Young Award winner was Barry Zito that year, also on that roster. League MVP, Miguel Tejada, was playing shortstop for this team. They don't talk about those guys at all. They make it seem like it's, you know, old man David Justice and Bradford throwing submarine. Those were like the stars, and that wasn't necessarily the case at all. Uh, Chavez over at, uh, Chavez over at third base. Eric Chavez was awesome that year. They barely even mentioned him in the movie. So that's my problem with Moneyball. But my favorite overall, hands down, favorite baseball movie has to be the original Major League. So I got this here. I'm going to throw it up here if you guys can see it. There we go. This one. And I got like the special edition, which uh, if you're looking on YouTube, you can see it's got the uh, the turf on the cover there. It's called the Wild Thing Edition. And this movie is awesome. Easily my favorite one. 
And I'll tell you why, since I've got your attention. Um, first off, so quotable. So many great quotes in this one. Hilarious moments, obviously. And most of them I can't really go into because they cuss. And I'll get in trouble if I cuss on this. But, uh, you know, the characters. Wild Thing, Rick Vaughn. I got a Rick Vaughn uh, t-shirt over here. Can't wear it on the stream, though, because he's grabbing his grabbing his cup <laughs> on, the, on the photo. Uh, Jake Taylor, Dorn, Willie Mays Hayes. Uh, Pedro Serrano, Lou Brown, the manager, uh, Eddie Harris, Jesus Christ can't hit a curveball. I mean, so many great quotes. Uh, and of course, speaking about quotes, the incredible Bob Euchre playing Harry Doyle. And I, I do a lot of PA work for, uh, not only baseball, but you know, I do hockey and stuff and we still do Harry Doyle quotes all the time. Just about every single game that we do. Yeah, there's some sort of Harry Doyle quote. Just a bit outside. Tried the corner and missed. So many good ones. And I get I kind of went long there, so but uh, I apologize. But anyway, if you have favorite movies, maybe I didn't mention some of your favorite baseball movies, drop them down in the comment section on YouTube, or you can hit me up on Twitter. Let me know there as well. I, I could talk movies and baseball with you guys all day. But um, I don't know. I, I like what the team's got right now as far as the Cardinals. Um, they got a lot going on. Great opportunity here to do even more damage in the next two weeks with that week's schedule. So uh, it all starts tonight at Bush Stadium against the Cubs. First pitch again, 7-15 St. Louis time. Thanks again for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen every day. Now for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022, an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. The local team experts of the Locked on Podcast Network, plus a betting angle from Lee Sterling of Locked on Bets, all combining into one ultimate nfl preview you can search for ultimate pro football preview 2022 on your odyssey app youtube or wherever you get your podcast we got nfl football regular season starting on thursday next week it'll be the buffalo bills at the defending world champion los angeles rams so who are you rooting for in that one fantasy football we've got fantasy football podcasts on the locked on network as well if you if you're into fantasy and you want to you want to check that out we got you covered here at Locked On. As always, be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow on Twitter at LO underscore Cardinals and at JD Sports Radio. You are the best fans in baseball for a reason, and I will see you next time right here on Locked On Cardinals.